Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Matter is a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub. Uh, we really do three things. So we incubate startups. We have uh, more than 200 member companies that range from very early stage ventures to growth stage businesses. And we have a suite of services to help them grow at every stage along the way. Second thing we do, uh, we help big companies and health systems innovate better. Uh, we have around 60 corporate partners and we work with them on their innovation strategy, helping source and co-develop solutions that uh, advance their goals. And the third thing is we are a nexus for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation and transformation. We bring people together to be inspired, to learn and to connect with each other. And today we have one of our signature programs, Tales from the Trenches, where we talk with seasoned entrepreneurs about their journey. How did they get started? What are they trying to accomplish? And what have they learned along the way? Uh, our guest today is Dr. Khan Siddiqui. And uh, Dr. Siddiqui is truly one of the most interesting entrepreneurs that I have met. Uh, he has started or helped start uh, dozens of companies, including Higgy, uh, which he founded and which has uh, become quite well known. Uh, and his current company, Hyperfine, uh, which is building a portable MRI machine, which you can see uh, behind him. Uh, he helped develop the Xbox Connect technology when he was at Microsoft. He's a radiologist and developed and performed the first ever fetal cardiac MRI when he was at Geisinger. Uh, he has uh, an uh, enormous number of stories to tell, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing them. Uh, we produced this program, Tales from the Trenches, with uh, Village MD, which is a Chicago-based company innovating in value-based uh, care. They, they operate in 10 markets. Uh, they work with physician practices to implement uh, real value-based care models. And I will say that, uh, you know, in my world and in, in our world, uh, I hear people and organizations talk about value-based care all the time, uh, but I rarely meet companies that are actually doing it at scale and with the uh, success and the vision of uh, Village MD. Um, our moderator today is uh, Paul Martino. He is the co-founder and chief growth officer at Village uh, MD. Um, prior to starting Village MD, he had a senior uh, role at Anthem and WellPoint, and he's been in the healthcare uh, industry for uh, 30 years. And this is not his first rodeo uh, at Tales from the Trenches. So I know he's going to do a great job asking uh, questions. Um, and speaking of questions, if you have questions for Dr. Siddiqui, uh, use the chat function on Zoom, and Paul will incorporate those into the program. Uh, finally, for those of you who signed up for the post-event networking, uh, you will get an email in a few minutes from Charlene Fan, who's part of the Matter team, that will include uh, the link to click on at the conclusion of the main program. So with that, I turn it over to Paul to lead what will be a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, good morning, if you're uh, morning time or afternoon if you're on the East Coast. And Dr. Siddiqui, good morning to you. Good afternoon, maybe. Thanks, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. So I guess uh, one of the fascinating things that's been happening is everybody's been doing Zoom. You kind of get to see people's living rooms and kitchens and spare bedrooms and cribs for kids and all this sort of stuff. But uh, this background is a new one on me. This looks like a better, faster version of C-3PO from Star Wars. So, so what do we have going on in the background? Let's start there. So these are our two MRI uh, scanner machines that you see in my background. Uh, these are the world's first portable uh, point of care MR devices. Literally the idea is to take MR to the patient's bedside. Uh, and uh, scan over there. So we're trying to, you know, decentralize MR and make it more patient-centric. So that's the vision of the company, and that's what these things are. So on that topic, are they uh, are they in use today, or are they co coming soon? Yeah. So we got our uh, FDA approval on a prototype device in February of this year, and uh, we have now ten sites. I see eleven sites. Ten no, eight sites with eleven scanners deployed. 
already. So uh, most of them on research use, but some clinical use also, especially since the COVID uh, pandemic started, we got started getting a lot of requests for scanner for COVID units, COVID ICUs, things like that. So yeah. Fascinating. Uh, are they made in the US? Yes, so uh, companies headquartered in Guilford, Connecticut, near uh, New Haven, and the manufacturing, we are manufacturing with a partner called Benchmark Electronics in New Hampshire. So it's all US made. That is un unbelievable. We'll maybe talk more about that again at the end. Uh, yeah. Before we do that, let's uh, talk a little bit about you and your journey, if you don't mind. Uh, can you share some of your background on people and how, you, how and why you decided to become a physician? Wow. Um, <clears throat> so my journey has probably been very unorthodox and not follow the typical, typical journey you would think of. I grew up in Pakistan um, in a smaller size town, um, but I had having uh, uh, very inspirational parents, both physicians, and really motivated me in earlier on into thinking about uh, different aspects of it. So my uh, my father was a uh, trained uh, hand surgeon who then converted to becoming oncological surgeon, then also got degrees in uh, um, radiation oncology. So he kind of practiced all of the above kind of scenario and got exposed to radiation oncology equipment when I was very young. So for example, my first uh, access to a computer was a PDB-11 for a nuclear medicine gamma camera um, in sixth grade, where I wrote my first program. I mean, that's how kind of got, got started. I mean, sitting kid and sitting in Pakistan. You wrote your, first, your first program in sixth grade? On a PDB-11, right? So you know, don't even know what that I is. was busy playing hopscotch and you were doing some real work. <laughs> so keep going. So anyway, so, you know, that led to me start working on, again, I've always worked on problems, never thinking that this is going to be a business idea or, or opportunity, but it has become. So my first problem that somebody asked me to solve was uh, building an exam management system like and especially in Pakistan where there are 1500 medical students going through med school like how do you grade and assess and things like that and everything used to be in this late 80s right so you everything is hand hand done by hand so wrote a um, uh, small little program to do exam management handling results reporting and things like that and as you know how it is feature requests feature creeps start happening up and suddenly you have a full-blown end-to-end exam user management system, MCQ bank, and things like that. So that became my first uh, software that, I, that was being used by four academic institutions globally in the late 80s and got acquired. So I didn't think I was selling a company at that time, but or being an entrepreneur, but in hindsight, that's what it was. So, and that got me really fascinated about, you know, medicine, obviously having two uh, very uh, role models at home. So I decided to go to med school uh, and, and I landed in med school, being the only med student in 1990 that knew how to code, kind of became a very interesting opportunity. So I would get sucked into all the time. Fortunately for me, there were things happening in parallel in that time. So for example, CDC chose uh, the Aga Khan University in Karachi as the level five um, infectious disease center hub for Southeast Asia. So we had 35 people from CDC land to establish the center. And then one of the faculty over there, Dr. Stephen Luby, wanted uh, some help with stats. And they were using an open source um, uh, stats program called EpiInfo and didn't have linear regression model prediction kind of a unit. And he knew the math behind and all the algorithms needed to do disease prediction. And uh, they found me. Uh, so I ended up writing some of that code to do uh, linear regression modeling and machine learning kind of, this is like, early 90s, right, to predict, do disease prediction, then we applied that to nosocomial pneumonias and the health system, and then eventually economic analysis, so really predicting what the cost uh, our burden is going to be at the, at the time of an admission for a patient and things like that. So very early on, got access to, you know, we're running on a Meditech, uh, uh, very early on EMR, runs on, running on a month's database, using proprietary Java called magic language, you know, so got exposed to mumps very earlier on. Um, and um, long story short, uh, graduated and moved to uh, NYU to do my internship. Again, immediately got sucked into a lot of the health IT stuff, uh, ended up getting involved into the um, uh, progress node template um, 
production for the VES Vista EHR. I'm not going to go to how that even has happened, but had uh, really started that work uh, over there and then moved to Geisinger uh, Health System for my radiology training and immediately became involved in the PAC selection process. This is 1999, right? So um, when did you come, when did you actually come to the U.S.? 98 to do my internship. And, and was and it NYU. to New York? Is that where yeah. you came yeah. to? Yeah. It's a, at the school. Yeah. Yeah. Or, is that right? Yes. The medical school? No, medical resident? school. I did medical in Pakistan at the Aachen University, okay. and then I moved my residency to the U.S. See. So, so anyway, long story short, Geisinger got involved with the PACS implementation. Uh, we were one of the first sites uh, uh, that implemented Stentor PACS, which became Philips' eyesight PACS. Um, that became very successful. And there were, um, I was focusing on my clinical aspect of it, but I would get sucked into uh, um, I got in, be asked to be on the EHR selection committee and then eventually to a strategy team for um, the CEO for Geisinger. So, you know, as a trainee, getting those opportunities were unbelievable uh, opportunities for me. So, yeah, that's kind of the early journey from my training and kind of getting there. Yeah. So keep going because you have uh, founded and been part of a number of different uh, organizations. I'd love to talk about some of them like Higgy, but tell us a little sure. bit about that transition, right? Because you you went from yeah. in-school, academic, technology orientation, boom, entrepreneur. Yeah. So my goal really was to stay in academics. So I was focusing on a pediatric cardiac and fetal cardiac MR research. So all my work early on was on that uh, aspect of it. So as Stephen mentioned, we did one of the first in utero fetal cardiac MR in 2001, right? I mean, it's like unheard of in those days. But, you know, uh, you know my wife, I think my wife would say the same thing, like, you know, like, you know, you spend so much time with clinical research and you, there are five people in the world who will even read what you're writing and you go this 10 minute and this IT meeting and the entire health system talks about what the effort you're doing. So why are you resisting this change to your informatics career? So, and I had like this, you know, uh, FOMO or even our, uh, our imposter syndrome, if you think of it that way, because I didn't go to an engineering school or any kind of computer science school. So I'd always had this fear that I may not be good enough for this aspect of it. So I thought maybe there should be some training program for informatics. There were some medical informatics training programs out there in the country, but nothing in imaging. So I start calling around to asking if there's any fellowship available with anybody and nobody had one. And then uh, one fruitful call with um, uh, Dr. Elliot Siegel, who was the uh, vice chair of research at University of Maryland and chair at the VA in Baltimore, and uh, convinced him to start a fellowship program in informatics. So he turned around and said, I'll do it if you come and start it. <laughs> so I moved. And so from, you took him up on it. Yeah, so I started the country's first uh, imaging informatics training program at University of Maryland and trained pretty much most of the radiology informatics folks that are out there today. Um, got in, invited to be chair of the American College of Radiology Informatics Committee and Commission. So the founding chair of that, built an entire organization on really thinking through how national informatics, imaging informatics strategy needs to happen. Um, uh, and, and the lab grew pretty fast in, at Maryland uh, with 11 faculty members eventually and a um, lot of pick transfer coming out of that. Uh, in the informatics domain. Uh, a bunch of startups came out of that. Uh, one of them that came out got acquired by Nuance Communications, uh, focused on natural language processing, tech transfer to Fujifilm, tech transfer to uh, Kodak, which became CareStream. So a lot of stuff came out of that, uh, that work that we did. Um, I then got recruited by uh, um, Hopkins to come and become the center, of, uh, build the Center for tech, uh, Biomedical Imaging Informatics, which is now called the Center for Technology Innovation really a soft, software tech transfer office, if you think of it that way. And at the same time as I was doing that, uh, I got approached by Microsoft. So, and um, I moved to uh, Microsoft to initially focus on strategy and medical imaging, but then eventually execution on medical imaging related ac across all the healthcare product portfolio. So we had a Amalga enterprise imaging product, um, a PAC system, as well as patient related, you know, to, uh, image access and things like that. But Microsoft was fascinating because there were a lot of the problems we were trying to solve uh, became really horizontal problems that, got a, a, that were used by Microsoft overall. So I'll give you a few examples, right? So we had to figure out a compression technology. And now this is 2007, 2008 timeframe, right? So uh, we had to figure out how do we stream diagnostic quality images and over cellular networks because that's where we thought things are gonna be moving towards 
So we built, uh, we used to call HD Photo Inside as a compression codec, which became JPEG XR, and which became the foundation codec that Windows 8, Windows 10 eventually used for multimedia transfers, right? So, so those early codecs that we built ended up becoming that. We, uh, we started the machine learning AI team in 2008, uh, focusing on recognizing anatomy and pathology and medical images, one of the very early ones. Uh, a lot of the work that came out of that uh, on the random forest regression forest algorithms became the foundation of Xbox Connect. Uh, that happened. Um, a lot of the work that we did on uh, just storing uh, large files more efficiently with database became part of uh, SQL remote blob storage. And then that was the foundation of Azure's blob storage infrastructure technology. So, um, you know, the HIPAA compliance cryptography to handle PHI in Azure and securely came out of that work. Uh, so there were a lot of these big infrastructure work that we were trying to solve problems on medical imaging and ended up becoming much bigger fundamental uh, building blocks in what you see today in, uh, in Microsoft Azure and uh, other platforms. Um, so so did that for five years uh, and then um, uh, had an opportunity to um, uh, my last year at Microsoft uh, I was responsible for building some of the strategy and consumer health around health fall and based on that, but very interested in where it needs to go. And um, uh, with some interactions and connection with people, ended up being uh, coming to Chicago to build Higgy. So, so uh, yeah. talk a little bit, but you know, you so see you have this incredible background of mm -hmm. informatics, analytics, and medical sort of the convergence of this. And now, now you're about to start talking about the people part of it and engaging people. Before you, you do that, just t like, how do you think about this idea of informatics and, and medical services coming together? It, it, I, my world is around value-based care and slugging it out every day with physicians, mostly in private practice. And when I go into your average primary care practice, the, you, the machine that is used most is the fax machine. Right, that, that's a throwback to like 72. Yeah. So how do you think about that? And how do you think about enabling this technology to be uh, deployed more easily, de deployed more usefully to get the greatest utility out, utility out of it across the system? Yeah, I think the way I think about this really is, you know, is this solving the problem that the person is thinking about and help them think through away from the technology, the tool they're using, but efficiency and use of the uh, of what they're trying to do right so that's the framework that needs to switch right so like i'll give you an example of our mr scanner today right whenever we talk about mr scanner everybody thinks you know the conventional 1.5 scanner right so so it's almost feels like you know we are trying to we have a model t ford and everybody wants a faster horse kind of scenario right so you have to kind of better buggy whip <laughs> exactly right so you're going to reframe thing like what are the problems like you know what are you trying to do how you how do we actually are building the value to the patient itself how are you actually building and solving those problems itself and it just becomes part of the extension of it so i do analogy for example in this scenario is we like a portable x-ray machine it doesn't replace the x-ray machine sitting in the radiology department but it's now available anywhere in the hospital you need to image because patient can move in not easy to access or scenarios where it's just not possible to have a scanner, a uh, big scanner deployed. It's not replacing it, but it's complementing that aspect of it. So I think it's the reframing of, uh, of the focus on technology to focus more on the problem it's trying to solve and the value it's creating is very important. And I think that's one of the things that I learned in my informatics training and training others is that, how do you think about that, right? I mean, physicians, my, my, I mean, a lot of people have heard me say this, we are trained to treat. We are not trained to explain pathophysiology to a patient. When a patient comes in with a headache, here's Tylenol, go take it three times a day and come back if it doesn't improve. That's what our answer is, right? Our answer is not that your prostaglandin cycles are not working and all these things that are coming out and stimulating nauseous receptors and you know, Tylenol is going to go do this and uh, that's how it's going to improve it. We don't go explain that. But from a technology point of view, I want to understand what the problem is. I want to know what the bottleneck is so I can come up with a creative solution of solving that problem. So I need to understand the pathophysiology of the problem that you're talking about, not just the solution. But because we are trained in med school uh, and through our training to just treat, whenever we ask a physician, what do you want, you know, or what you should be doing, and the solution comes out first rather than the actual underlying problem. I have stories after story after story on 
repeatedly where I've gone through and dissected out the actual underlying problem for a scenario when somebody's asking for some change or some product feature. So that, I think that's what it is that needs to happen. Yeah. yeah. So there is a question from the audience, and I might as well ask it now since you uh, went back to the mobile scanners here in a minute. Um, so uh, the question was around the cost and the availability of the scanner. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You mentioned that the conventional scanners that are out in the market and health systems today are a million, a million and a half dollars. What's the cost of the hardware and the software and operating it? And let's talk about that. Yeah, so I think, I think I'll ask the um, um, cost question also, uh, but let me, just, let me give you a little bit of what, how much innovation had to happen for this to even be possible. So typically MRI scanner requires a Faraday cage. And the reason you require a Faraday cage is because you want to shield from all the radio frequency and electromagnetic magnetical interference that is in the environment. And you need a big uh, magnet so that you can ground down any of the earth's magnetic field and other uh, environmental things that are coming and disrupting so you can actually do the imaging properly. So a lot of innovation has happened is pushing the magnet bigger, but no, lot, very few people have looked at how do we actually now think about the reason we need a Faraday cage and address that problem? So the biggest technology we focused on was how do we cancel out the RF shielding? Can we do that? How do we improve the signal um, processing that is coming out of it? Even the sensors to be able to detect the hydrogen precession resonance that happens uh, in these scenarios, right? So a lot of these technologies that we end to end build is just thinking through how do we reduce power consumption? How do we reduce uh, external interferences? How do you make it safe so there's no projectile risk for any metal coming into, th into the space? And how do we actually get the diagnostic quality images with uh, lower field strength, right? That ends up becoming. So we went to a permanent magnet that we kind of designed ourselves in house. We went to uh, RF noise canceling technology, the way, you know, Bose headset headphones have active noise cancellation. And uh, we basically work on all electronics and miniaturize them to put it under the uh, box that you see down there. Uh, so it requires power consumption, same as a coffee maker, can plug it into any 110 volt. And by doing this, we really reduce the cost dramatically. So our go-to market cost right now is uh, it's a combination of subscription as well as hardware. So primarily if somebody wants to do a subscription only, starts at like 7,000 something a month and then goes down based on volume and contract size. If somebody wants to buy it, the hardware is um, uh, 50,000 uh, to start with and plus uh, subscription for maintenance software, software applications and other things on top of it. So dramatically, small. it's cheaper than a service contract that a typical scanner would have. Right, that's right, yeah. Uh, durability of it, how, it, how do you think about it? Uh, what, what problems do you anticipate? Yeah, so um, so first of all, the permanent magnet, because it's a permanent magnet, it has, you know, life lifespan and measured in centuries, <laughs> not in years. Right. Um, electronics would have typical, you know, your five to 10 year kind of electronic refresh, depending on what is happening uh, aspect of it. Um, from a projectile risk, there's hardly any risk. The yellow line that you see on top of the scanner, that's the five gauze line, it's about a two and a half feet from the center. So anything outside that, there is not even a magnetic force you can detect uh, aspect of it. That's the safest line you think of it. So uh, there's uh, literally, this is safer than anything that is out there right now. Um, and, uh, you know, people are using it in heavily electronic uh, environment in the ICUs and ER medicine, right? So our, for us, the best one was we went to consume electronic show on the show floor, I and mean, we can talk about electromagnetic interference. I mean, probably the most rich environment is because of the electronic show, right? So, and be able to right. scan right. scan people over there, it just was an uh, amazing experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, where, where do you see it being used? You know, my world is value-based care, and when I look at the cost and, and the likely cost of the actual image, it, it uh, it gets me pretty excited, uh, especially because of the world I live in, value-based yep. uh, model and performance and risk contracts. Yep. So w where do you think it's going to be mostly? That, that's exactly right. I mean, our thought was really to reduce the cost uh, of the care, right? I mean, um, so the, in our initial go-to market has been focused on ICUs, emergency medicine, pediatric type of applications. But as you were talking about, right, this really become can become the frontline uh, of imaging as part of a uh, you know value-based effort where uh, you know very fast stroke screening and things like that can happen on the scanner. 
um, even in scanner and ambulance kind of scenarios, right? I mean, this is small enough, they can be fit into an ambulance too. So before even you showed up in the ER, you can have a scan done. Uh, and wake up stroke guidelines changed last year, requiring now just 25% of all strokes uh, require now MR as the first line of modality. So we're ideal for that. Um, we got uh, 20 of our scanners got bought by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for screening for infant asphyxia as well as uh, neonatal brain development because of malnutrition issues. MR has for a very long time known to be the best biomarker for those two indications, but cost has prevented to be a screening tool. And with our price point, we become a screening modality for a global health problem that exists out there right now. So literally, it is designed for value-based care kind of scenarios. I think they, as adoption goes up and more penetration happens, you'll see more and more pairs uh, becoming interested in, in this being the front line uh, of a lot of those uh, high, high cost, high risk uh, procedures. Yeah, you, so brilliant, just brilliant. Now, you, you said this, you, you can put this in an ambulance. Not this version of it, but you can imagine this can fitting in easily. It's only 1,300 uh, some pounds, so it can easily fit into it. But I don't, I don't think in this configuration it would, we'd have to do some modification you, know, you don't need wheels in an ambulance. You don't need some of that stuff, but, uh, right. but it's definitely the size is five foot tall and about 30 some inch wide in diameter, right? So it's pretty small a size scanner. Got it. Well, uh, you really have the audience's attention here. So because I'm getting a lot of questions coming in. So, so let me uh, see if I can ask a few of those. There was a question about the uh, homogeneity of the permanent magnet and how many PPM. Yeah, I think a lot of these specs are available online. So if you go to hyperfine.io, that's probably the best place to see it. And you can even pre-order it if you want to from there. Um, uh, so the center of the uh, scanner, uh, it reads about 700 gauze and the five gauze line goes down to where the yellow, uh, uh, two and a half feet from the center of the scanner. Um, it's pretty homogeneous. We do a lot of uh, interesting things, both from a software point of view and the hardware point of view to create a uniform uh, aspect of the scanner. I mean, the question is coming in because those one of the issues happen in permanent magnets and that's one of, been, have been one of the innovations that we've done around this. We design our own magnet, so uh, it's under our control how to do it. Right. Another benefit because of that, sorry to Paul, quickly add it to, so because typical MR scanner when it's deployed requires on-site shimming because there are, you know, steel in the walls and other things happening. So you can't just pre-shim and scanner and send it. For our scanner, it comes pre-shimmed, which is calibrated to be uniform when it arrives in the hospital because it doesn't have interference from surroundings as much. Yeah, good. Another question uh, from the audience is around team. And I love this question because, you know, with what you were thinking about, this, is, this to me is a revolutionary um, innovation in, in imaging in this case. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of qualities, what kind of characteristics were you looking for? What do you want to avoid? If you had to do it over again, would you do it the same way with the same people? Uh, all about the team, right? Yeah, it's all about the team, right? So I think the reason I joined Hyperfine was because of the team. And I think the team knows this very well too. It's like, it has to be right. So we have one of the best MR sequence designer, one of the best MR magnet engineers, best mechanical engineers, best electrical engineers. It's just like unbelievably awesome team. If you look at their, their each one of their CV is just like unbelievable how much, you know, biomedical engineers, physicists, it's just been amazing to see. And the people have, people on the team that have built seven Tesla scanners, people on the team that have done extensive research, you know, uh, in MR space and are well known in the industry. Um, both from the physics point of view and engineering point of view also. So that has been the key aspect of it. It has taken five years and a lot of partnerships with academics also to get it to where it is. So it has been, uh, has been very, very interesting. So we are la we've launched with our bread and butter uh, neuro sequences. So T1, T2 diffusion weighted imaging and flare as our main uh, imaging uh, sequences uh, initially, which is typically what any, uh, most of the brain imaging uh, is done on. Uh, uh, images are slightly higher noise just because of uh, uh, the permanent magnet and low field strength. It's a 64 milli Tesla scanner. So if you think of it, our traditional uh, hospital scanner is 1.5 Tesla. This is 64 milli Tesla, so it's a pretty low field strength, and it's amazing the kind of quality we're getting out of it um, uh, from even at that low field strength. So uh, yeah, it, at the end of the day, it's all about the team, right? And tackling a problem one at a time, right? How do you solve the noise issue? How do we solve 
the magnet homogeneity issues, how do we solve probability issues? It needs to go up ramps. How do you do that if you need to go, you know? So it has been pretty fascinating, uh, the team uh, and how everybody on the team has contributed and innovated. I mean, I always talk about, right? People, people ask me this question about, you know, how do you build a, uh, you know, innovative team or how do you build a, uh, uh, you know, some office of innovation aspect of it. To me, it's all about the culture and the culture starts from the top. So if you want to innovate, your entire organization have to have a culture of innovation. People have to be not afraid of trying out and failing. So you can't just go keep failing all the time, but you need to have tolerance to experimentation and failure uh, so that people are not uh, afraid or get penalized uh, for trying things out. And ideas never, really evolve from one person's uh, own brain, right? They're usually the network effects that happen and usually it's prior work or prior experience that, you know, combine or add on top of previous experiences to solve some problems. Uh, and sometimes ideas stay in somebody's brain for decades and slowly over experience and time, you start to figure out what those, uh, what those solutions are. So it, it's literally never really a Eureka moment. It's always a, slower turtle race uh, kind of scenario for innovation to happen. Yeah, so uh, another question now around uh, reimbursement, right? You know, if you think about it, I, as a former payer guy, you know, you see some innovation like this and the first thing that you think of is, you know, everybody's gonna get an image. Like somebody comes in, as you said earlier, with a headache and instead of saying, you know, take two Tylenol and come back in a couple of days if you're not feeling better, well, well let's just throw them in this and get, get a scan and see if everything's going on okay. So they're always gonna be worried about utilization, right? How, are you, how do you think about it from the reimbursement from a payer perspective and yeah. how do you get covered? Yeah, absolutely. So the existing reimbursement code already exists for brain imaging for low field MR. So we're thinking that's exactly what everybody will use. But I think the interesting model is going to be the ACOs and pairs that go into like, we will do these imaging uh, just because it reduces overall cost. You know, ER times are lost. You know, we don't have, uh, you know, post ER or intermittent observation units observing stroke patients, we can make a quick decision and move them on here and there. I mean, the, the, just imagine the amount of cost reduction that happens by reducing ER time or just admission because of, you know, you're not observing people anymore and you're discharging, you know, what well, most people image for neurological symptom in ER end up being normal scans. I mean, if I looked at some data, 60% of patients I'm coming up with some kind of abnormality eventually don't have anything or have it a TIA or something like that and they're discharged home, and but they stay in observation unit for a while to figure out what needs to happen. So the cost really comes in of the uh, inpatient, long inpatient stay, not actually the scanner itself, right? So they definitely right. are there. Our plan is to do a partnership with some folks to do economic analysis of how we benefit longitudinally and actually what kind of cost reduction we bring in by quickly doing the imaging upfront. Uh, but I think if that's where we would eventually move towards to is a more of a value-based kind of use case, use on our scanner. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Let's, uh, let's this is a, love the discussion here, let's, uh, but let's back up a little bit. Sure. Let's go back to Higgy and let's go back to 2012, even before 2012, when you were sure. thinking about it, what were you thinking about that led to you launching this uh, new company? So I think um, um, I was thinking about a consumer strategy on how do you get you know, millions of people engaged in their health. At the same time, um, uh, there were folks at Merrick Ventures in Chicago also thinking about what is the next killer consumer uh, app? I mean, the idea was like, you know, there's uh, uh, patients should own their own data and how do you actually think about engaging the patient? And the, and the, the way I was thinking about it is that the value-based care is happening. Um, physicians is try, are, We'll be now asked to take risk on patients, but we know that most of the risk data is sitting between care episodes, right? So what patient does during the daily life is contributes more to our, we call no social determinants of health, also con contribute more to the risk on a patient than what happens during a care episode. So how do we capture the data? You know, everybody at that time was jumping on wearables, right? Well, let's build a new wearable and do the stuff. And we thought, okay, what are the problems that actually exist? So we realized problems are, cardiovascular, obesity, diabetes, those are the big costs, uh, costs of the systems. And the cost sitting mostly in elderly and 
and low income. So it's Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and uh, Medicaid, right? So how do we actually think about that uh, market segment? And um, and we realized that this or the or these would be hard in 2012 to do something with, right? So that's where we came up with this idea of building a data platform to understand risk and something that engage with patient, but actually deliver it through a complementary hardware product, uh, our kiosk that we deployed in grocery stores and pharmacy to understand cardiovascular risk and uh, uh, obesity risk and diabetes risk of those patients. You know, started in 2012, everybody said, thought it was a crazy idea that we shouldn't be building a kiosk. Kiosk has existed from the 80s, since the 80s. <laughs> this model doesn't work. All the things, well, see it now, right? I mean, Hagee's now over 10,000 uh, stations deployed, the largest uh, kiosk network in the country right now with amazing partnership with payers, with telehealth providers, with uh, health systems and uh, growing. So uh, it really was that idea of um, how do we actually get patients more responsible for their um, health and get them aware of and engage with them in the healthcare moment where they are. And we took the retail route as a unique route to, to tackle the problem, especially focused on elderly and low income population. And we realized that that's where they were engaging more than the acute care setting. So this idea of uh, patient behavior change, right? Uh, I, I remember uh, back when, um, we first got all of our value-based contracts at the first clinic that we started working with in Houston. And I went to the physician, uh, the leadership forum that evening, it was a Thursday evening. And my job was to report out that we had now successfully negotiated value-based reimbursement across all the payers. Yeah. And so one of the docs raises his hand and he said, so let me see if I understand this right. I'm now at risk for all of my patients. I said, well, not exactly. These are shared savings. This is 2013, so kind of early in the risk yep. journey. Um, and I said, not really. These are shared savings contracts, and they're one way only, so upside opportunity. And he kind of paused and said, yeah, no, I understand that. And, and thank you for, for negotiating these uh, very good contracts for us. Let me ask you, uh, what are you going to do to help me get better patients? Yeah. And right, so it, 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 the energy and, and the oxygen in the room was trying to help them understand risk profile and all this sort of yeah. stuff of their patient acuity, their patient population. And, and so I said to this particular doctor, I said to him, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I saw a patient today. He's been my patient for over 25 years. I've been telling him for 25 years, he needs to stop smoking and he still needs to stop smoking. Yeah. And so how do you think about this idea of really changing the consumer behavior? Yeah, I learned this something. So, I, I, you know, as part of the Higgy initiative, we talked to a lot of people and learn. And, and I think my first learning actually happened with the Xbox team, right? When I was talking to them about this idea of gamification and how do we think about a behavior strategy, like, like you know, so when, when, you, when you hear the numbers on, at that time, this is 2011, right? Xbox at that time live had... 350 million total users globally and 55 million daily active users, right? I mean, completely like, like that, if you see those numbers and compare healthcare, we fail, right? I mean, that's what like dramatically <laughs> failed, right? In 2011, right? So the so question was like, okay, fine, how do we take this learning and apply it? So like, you know, and we think about, you know, is the game mechanics work? I mean, and when I asked that question, I was hoping I would get the answer of, use this video game technique and it'll work, right? And he was like, we don't think that way. We think traditional games. We think, he's like, Khan, you have a problem. For our Xbox, we have to sell a game every new year. So our game has to end by the end of the year, right? So that we can come up with a new version of it or something else out of it so we can sell more. You need a game that doesn't end and still motivating for millennia. And he goes like, the games that I can think of that people have played for centuries are chess, hide and seek snacks and letters and things that, like that, that have been played across uh, cultural boundaries, across millennia, across gender, across age gaps, right? So we ended up using hide and seek. And then if you think of it, like there's a lot of psychological stuff written about game mechanics, different these old games, like we took hide and seek as our main game mechanics and how we will engage the users. And, um, and hide and seek has been played forever and it has three components to it. It has simple narrative, you hide, you find, there's no complexity behind it. Uh, the second one is it has progressive mastery, which means that game can become difficult during the gameplay. So if you're playing today, 
after a while, it's hard to find place to hide that other can, can find. Or, and it, it progresses over age. So when you're young, you can play as a toddler in the same room, but you're a teenager, you can play in the neighborhood. And an adult, you can play in the entire city, right? So there's a progressive mastery that happens over time also. And then there's a cooperation. Even though you are hiding from the guy looking for you, you have to cooperate with the people you're hiding with because if they hide in the same location as you are, then you're going to get into trouble. You're all going to get Everybody into gets busted at the end. Right. <laughs> so there's a competition and cooperation that needs to happen together to make this work. So that's the social influence aspect of this whole thing. So we kind of thought through how do we bring those elements in our behavior change ideas? Not exactly the way, but like how do we make the narrative very simple? How do we say, you know, focus on, and then the other thing we focus on is that, that more of an uh, uh, process outcomes rather than uh, end goal outcomes. So for example, you know, one thing that I learned uh, from a lot of the folks who gave me this in the early days of Figgy was that you can't keep losing two pounds forever. So it, the day comes in which you cannot do it anymore and that's the day that the habit gets dissociated. How do we find a process that can stay for your life? So that's where, you know, can you walk 10,000 steps a day or 5,000 steps a day forever? Can you do eat healthy regularly, but just make a lifestyle change forever rather than to a particular goal that is out there. And the process improvement will lead to goal uh, changes of it. So we kind of we thought of all our mechanics and how do we think about how do we communicate to the patient? How do we build our product to with those kind of uh, fundamental elements of it? Uh, the w one thing that I realized was that, um, uh, that there's, there's no such thing as unengaged user in healthcare. I think it's, we haven't found how to engage them. So, so we kind of create these personas and, and discard, or oh, these patients will never do it. I think that's a wrong thought process. We need to think about like, okay, fine, if they're not engaging, what is the motivation? What is, what will motivate them? We kind of spend some time understanding what that is, is key. Yeah, and, and very difficult. Well, it, it, similarly, along this uh, same line of, of uh, th thinking and talking, mm -hmm. Um, there's a, another, uh, several more questions from the audience. This particular question is around how you shift the narrative from uh, treatment-based to prevention-based and risk assessment. And if you think about it, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Escape Fire, which was a documentary that featured uh, the likes of Don Berwick and others. Mm -hmm. But um, Sharon, Sharon Brownlee was in that as a journalist. And one of the things that she said was, we actually have a sick care system in the United States, not a health care system, right? So, so talk a little bit about the orientation shift from one of, of sick care or treatment based to one of prevention and early detection. Yeah, I think it's the key, right? If you re really want to see our health system change and improve and actually deliver to the promise that we have given to our the entire population, we have to think about uh, the preventive aspect of it, right? It's, it's really hard to think about it. Um, um, you know, there's also dissociation of the economic self now and economics person in the future, right? So, so as a, as, as a, as humans, as, as Americans, we think of our future self as some other person. <clears throat> so really the fight really is, I'm talking about from the patient point of view first also, right? So fight really is that I'm going to eat healthy today, but the benefit somebody 10, who's going to be 10 years down the road. So in our brains, we dissociate those two as two different people. And it's right. fascinating, a lot of research on language and how language contributes to that, that association and thought process. So the cultures where there is lack of tense or the, there's not much differentiation between tense. So in English, it's very clear yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In some languages, such as Chinese and Mandarin, as well as Urdu, and there is no, the word for yesterday and tomorrow is the same word is how you say it in context. So there's a lot of work that has been done, some of the research that show that, that the, the more dissociated the tenses are, the less you see yourself in the future as the same person. And if you look at that data and see where, where the problems of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are, it are in those cultures, much more prevalent than those. It's not universal, but it's much more prevalent like that. So how do we think about ourselves and how do we help people understand uh, from a user, from a patient point of view, that it is you that is going to improve, and what is your short-term benefit? So get them to get to that space. But then, as you said, right, it's the whole ecosystem. It's not just be the patient themselves, but 
it needs to be what I call normative influence becomes the norm, right? Smoking used to be normal in the 40s and 50s, everybody smoked. And now it's not, so no, you know, since, you know, the, the dramatic law, drop in smoking cessation that has happened has been because it become norm not to smoke now. So are this dialogue that happens between the patient, physician, the pair, and all of that aspect of it needs to switch to this normative influence of preventive care. So once we get to where that is the norm that we have to focus on prevention, that's where we'll see acceleration of, uh, of this aspect of it. Today, it's not, right? Today, it's really episodic and you know, care episode-driven dialogue that happens. So I think, how do you change the narrative and every aspect of the journey through the patient, not only directly communication with the patient, but also between uh, providers as well as when they interact with, uh, uh, patient interact with the provider also. So I kind of think it very different answer than what I, you would see about it, because I kind of think of it more holistically, what needs to happen globally to, for, for this to become more of a norm. And I think that's right. as dialogue across all stages has to change. Yeah. So you, you, you've mentioned this uh, sort of uh, new, it, it become, gets woven into the fabric and it becomes the new normal. Smoking is the example that you used. I can't help but ask my, uh, you the question, and I'm asking myself this question every day. What does the new normal look like in this COVID environment? We have an office in the city of Chicago. We're doing this discussion today by Zoom. Normally, these are done in person. Um, uh, I, I, I've traveled uh, recently. And uh, the traveling, the requirement was to wear a mask. I'm fairly sure that's going to be the new normal in uh, airplane travel for the foreseeable future. What is it? What do you think it looks like? What does the re-entry actually look like? Wow, that's a that's a tough one. So, uh, really tough one, right? It's a, it's a tough one to think about, right? It's, so first of all, it's really hard to predict when these things are happening, right? In hindsight, there will be people who will be right and wrong and things like that. But I think a lot of people that are guessing is I think what is what is true. And you, you must have heard from everybody else that healthcare did get a 10 year jump start because of COVID. So telehealth becoming the norm and all that stuff, right? So we did get this big injection boost that has happened because of COVID. But that has been unbelievably awesome for healthcare. It has identified inefficiencies inefficiency in the system. It has identified acceleration of, as an opportunity to accelerate in certain areas of uh, diagnostics, testings, and other things also. So this is, this is amazing, right? So, so in my mind, companies and people who innovate and become the solution to the problems will thrive, uh, not just survive, and those who don't will actually go away, right? I think that, that this is also like a filter event is happening for us that's gonna shift out the noise between the two. What will the norm be? Um, uh, it, it's really hard to predict. I can do some guesses, but you know, I may be, 99% wrong at this time. I think we will see like a, till vaccination comes out, um, we will see these ups and downs. It won't be universal. It'll be regional, very local uh, aspect of it. So we'll have to think through, I mean, as you're seeing right now, as you know, New York, which was on the peak is coming down, Illinois is coming down, where other states are going up in their you know, other phases of it. And we'll see that throughout uh, and be very local recovery. Um, I think post COVID, um, well, let me be ask that. Yeah. Is there really a post-COVID, right? I mean, uh, we have an office yeah. that, you know, the, the, the configuration of the office will be different. The distance between workstations will be different. The kitchen uh, area uh, where you get pop and, and water and all, coffee and all these things will be different. The environment will be different. Mm -hmm. This conference room communication will be different. It will all be different, right? Um, so... What, what does that normal really look like? And what are some of the things that will change yeah. as a result of it? So I think I'll give you a philosophical answer here, right? If we keep the learnings and history from what we are going through this alive and keep talking about it, this new norm will stay. Because, you know, once in like, I mean, we've had pandemics before, right? And then everybody forgets about it and we move on. To the new life, right? So I think the risk of this is that, you know, decades from now, nobody remembers 2020 or what happened there. And we're back to doing all the things, right? So that's the risk. And I think it's up to us and our generation to make sure that the history of what happened, how decisions were made, and how do we make sure 
we make the right decision. I mean, it is mind boggling for me that one of the richest countries, the country that has advanced all the technology has been hit the hardest on this pandemic. It's just like unthought of. I mean, thinking of myself as, you know, a kid in Pakistan who's coming to US to get his training done. I mean, why do you come here? Like that's the greatest place to go train at. And then we see this happening and it's like, I can't believe that with all the innovation and all the stuff done and this is where we are. I mean, so, so there's this kind of moment that happens <laughs> to me when I think about that aspect of it, I, I think this can be the norm, right? There is no postcode, as you said, right? The way we are going is going to go. But if we, if we get to a scenario where we stop thinking and forget about what happened, then there's a risk that we go back to the bad behaviors. Right, right. So, um, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, innovators in the audience today. I, I imagine that there's a lot of people thinking not just about COVID, but other innovations in healthcare. What, what advice do you have for some of these folks today? Wow, that's a big one. Um, I think I've, so I get this question a lot, right? So like, well, how do we think about innovation? How do we think about coming into entrepreneurship? My, philosophy, my answer always is focus on the problem first. If you're not solving the problem that people care about, then you're, you know, uh, focus and marry to the problem, not to the idea. And then, then you can always pivot on the idea, right? Even in the Higgy's early days, right? We wanted to be the data platform for value-based care. And we even spent some time build, trying to build a video game, actual video game to do some of this stuff. And, you know, but we stayed focused on our problem and, and the kiosk became our solution that actually took us to the next level, right? So it's all about marrying to the problem and just being, you know, just 100%, 200% focused on solving that problem. And if idea is not working, iterate, pivot, iterate, pivot, test, try out. I think that's, that's the key to innovation if you want to do it. Uh, what I see a lot of times, uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect really is timing. Sometimes you're just too early and you may have to just take the long haul and stay, stay there to get to it. Uh, so idea may be the right, the team may be right, the time may be off. And third, obviously, is the team. So I can rank it in that scenario, right? Is the right problem you're trying to solve? Is the time the right time to be come out in the market? And do you have the right team to do it? It's very rare for an individual to do something and be innovative on. But it's a, my classic for example, and a lot of my employees will hear me say that it's much harder to find a out of the box thinker. It's much easier to build an out of the box thinking team. And right? so people with you know, different right. experience and thought process can actually innovate faster that way. So that, that would be my advice. So thinking about, you know, focus on the problem, make sure the right timing, timing also mean product market fit, if you think of it in, the, in our current terminology. And then last one is that, do you have the right team? Yeah, yeah. How do you think about capital, right? It, 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 we've been, now been successful in raising series A and B company's been growing. I feel great about it. How do you think about capital and capital deployment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Higgy, we've done multiple rounds of funding over there. I'm actually actively doing funding round for Hyperfine right now. I've done a bunch of others. So um, I think it's a, it's a necessary thing to scale. Right? It's really hard to scale without getting the right capital to understand. I think the, the, the issue is, are you holding your milestone? Are you ready to raise funding? A lot of so a lot of um, entrepreneurs and early first time founders get discouraged when they have five, 10 pitches that go to no. Like I give example, like my first fundraiser I ever did, I had 102 no's before I got my first person interested. Some, in some places we call that a slow learner, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So I mean, what I learned was that you have, it's a, it's a practice. It's a, you know, you have to, you have to trade, you have to practice, you have to try and see how it happens, right? So, I mean, now my philosophy is the first 20 pitches are people who I don't want money from, you know, because I want to perfect my pitch and hear what the questions are and how I'm trading on that whole idea and how do you go from there? And then, uh, then we go out there. I remember, you know, I forget which round was for Higgy that Jeff Bennett and I, you know, were doing independent calls, you know, daily <laughs> with uh, investors in parallel till we got somebody to say, yes, they want to meet, right? So um, yeah, those are, um, those are 
you know, interesting times, but you know, don't get discouraged, right? These are learning opportunities. Right, yeah. And I've learned over time is that, you know, you know if they say that's great, uh, you know, let's circle back some other time, which means um, now is to ask them like, who do you think is the right investor? Who do you interest in that? And can you make the introduction? So make something positive out of that interaction, even though they're passing on your stuff. Like how do you actually convert that into a, into a positive, you know, uh, or use them as advice, you know, uh, bouncing off point for the future. Right. You know, my, my view has always been, if it's a, if it's a, as you said earlier, I love what you said, if it's focus on the problem. So if there's a real problem that you're trying to solve, Yep. And there, it, my view is if it's a real problem, people call that the addressable market, all these other things, right? Yep. But if it's a problem that's truly a problem that you're trying to solve, you can pivot the idea. But if it's a true problem, and it's, it, even if it's a, an idea that needs pivoting, there's yeah. more money available out there that Definitely need right. good ideas and teams that can actually execute on those ideas. Yep. That, that's the short of what's in short supply, in my view. Yeah. One, another question just now. About this, this uh, they, the question is around, did you raise an angel round? Did, did you get any from Chicago investors? And how do you think about opportunities uh, in, in Chicago, specifically around medical device uh, rather than health IT? Yes, well, he gave you did. He, he gave you did uh, seed round uh, from Chicago. Um, uh, in those days, it was slightly more challenging than it would be uh, nowadays, I think nowadays, I think there's a lot more opportunity in Chicago. Uh, there's a lot of success that come out of in Chicago. I think the community is growing. Uh, it, it is still in, you know, uh, I have not done seed round for Hyperfine here. Uh, I mean, we are much farther ahead right now to uh, think about uh, uh, angel round aspect of it here. Um, I think there is this huge amount of opportunity in Chicago, right? I mean, there's a lot of experience, a lot of healthcare hub uh, focus here. Um, I'm not sure if there's still a myth that there's a lot more opportunity on the West Coast and East Coast for funding. I think there's a lot of stuff available. It's just, you know, how do you get in front of people and how do you get uh, uh, position your ideas the right way and, and talk about right. I think opportunities everywhere just need to understand you're able to uh, fulfill everybody's interest. One thing also people forget is that, and I'm sure Paul, you know this more than anybody, is that every VC and every investor has their own thesis on what they invest in. Right, so a lot of time I've seen founders who are going pitch don't understand that. Like what is their, who are they pitching to and what is their thesis? Who are they investing in? Have you talked to the CEO of the fund companies they've invested in before you're going to pitch? Why not, right? Learn what those things are, right? So I, I'm, I get surprised when people are going and talking to investors and not talk to other companies, founders that they've, they've been invested in, understand like, is that the right, you know, what do they look for and how do they think about it and, and, you know, and how do you position your pitch accordingly? So a lot of people talk about, you know, Chicago investors uh, don't invest early stage or have other things like that, but like, but that's the thesis, right? So you need to think about that's what their needs are and you need to pitch that way. And if that's not what you're trying to look for, then that's not for you and go for, go for the investor that are interested in it. The way you will not go to a automotive technology investor to pitch a healthcare idea, why would you go pitch to somebody that has a very different thought process on how they think about their thesis? And also, you know, stage of the round, people, a lot of people don't even know which round is available um, at a particular VC that they're investing in. You know, the end stage rounds are really hard to get angel funding on versus early stage rounds. So you, you need to do a lot of homework beforehand. Yeah. Well, we're just at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to ask one last quick question sure. and then we'll, uh, We'll end our session today. You you talked about your early uh, childhood in Pakistan. You were programming in the sixth grade. And I made a joke and said I was playing hopscotch, and I was badly, I might add. But um, what do you do for fun? You're unbelievably accomplished, thoughtful. I'm, I'm honored to have had the opportunity to talk with you today. What do you do for fun? I spend a lot of time with the family and the boys. I have two boys. One is starting college uh, in the fall, uh, the virtual college now. Another one is going to start high school now. So you either see me biking with them out there or with pre-COVID doing scuba diving with my elder one. Um, very active with them and their, their elder one is Eagle Scout. So the second one is trying to go into the direction and I've been very active. So for me, fun is really spending time with them. Um, and that's been my uh, most of my focus. 
of other stuff. I will just throw something else in, Paul, is that we're doing a webinar tomorrow for Hyperfine for COVID-19. If people go to hyperfine.io, they'll see a link to that. If they want to learn more about the scanner and how we're using in COVID, I would highly encourage, uh, it's actually tomorrow, so you can listen in. Well, you've been gracious with your time. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Khan Siddiqui, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Bye now.